Hello. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be talking about routing and scheduling in healthcare. And we're going to take a look and talk about applied examples. So real life examples of where this is applicable and also have an introduction to how we would solve these problems using some local search algorithms. So what do I mean by routing and scheduling? Well, if you're a health service provider, you typically have to make routine decisions. So decisions every day or every week or every month where you need to deploy a set of assets into a geospatial problem. Um, so for example, those assets might be a team of community nurses. So community nurses in the UK work for an NHS trust which specialises in treating patients in their own home. So for example, um, nurses may travel to a patient's home in order to help them inject insulin or to treat a dressing. So these might be vulnerable patients who are unable to come into healthcare um, and, a, and a nurse team needs to visit them. And there may be a large number of nurses within that team. They may have different skills and there may be um, a, a huge variety of patients out um, in the community that, that nurses need to find a way to treat optimally. A second classic example is patient transport. So we're talking about ambulance type transport here, but in a non-emergency context. So this is uh, there are, it's a bit like a taxi service that would go out and pick up patients at certain times and transport those patients into outpatient appointments. Um, and again, there might be a whole variety of types of patients out there um, and a whole variety of types of outpatient point appointments they need to be brought into. And there'll be some complications to do with appointment times and types of treatment um, that mean that this is a very hard problem to solve in practice. So this lecture is going to have a, a detailed look at the community nurses problem to start off with and then we'll think about how can we go about solving these problems with data science approaches. Welcome back. Okay, so let's have a think about the community nursing problem. So in this prop, this problem is represented quite nicely by this picture. Um, so this nurse has to travel to see a cohort of patients in a geographic patch. Those patients may have quite different problems and the nurse will have to have the right sort of skills to treat those patients. So, for example, they might need to be trained in wound care. Now, in practice, there will be a team of nurses that will do this job. So there won't just be a single nurse that is travelling around. And there may be something uh, like 100 patients that need to be seen in a day. Um, so the types of information that healthcare services have are a list of jobs or a list of services that they need to um, go out and, and do. So for example, here we've got a table at the top with the service ID, um, the patient name, um, their address. Uh, we've got a time window. So this is a, a, a first complication that comes in. So we can see that um, service ID 1 needs to take place really between 9am and 11am. And the type of service is insulin. So this is helping a patient with an insulin injection. And there's some additional information in there. So uh, that, that patient keeps cats. Um, and we'll see why that's relevant later on. Um, and then for the second service, we can see that they have a time window and that the service type's a bit vague here. But the, the important thing is this is a double service. So two nurses are needed to tackle this problem. So potentially this could be just a safeguarding issue. So um, the patient may be violent, so you need a second nurse there, or it may be a type of treatment that requires two nurses. And then for the third um, service, uh, example service, um, that's the same patient, that's John Smith again um, from, from service two. Um, but there's a dependency here. So this is an insulin injection and that needs to take place at least 30 minutes after um, service number two. So there's an, a further convocation that's been added in there. Then we have a list of nurses. So these are, these are the, our available assets or resources on that day. 
and we can see that the nurses um, have different skills. So uh, nurse one and nurse three are trained in insulin injections um, and nurse two and nurse three are trained in blood tests, but nurse one and nurse two have, have completely different skills. There's no overlap. You can see that they work on different shifts um, they may or may not be on call, which means you may be able to call them out um, to help or not. Um, they may start from different locations. So some may be starting from the main hospital, or that may be a GP surgery, um, or some may be starting from their home address. And we can see just a contrived example here, although it's a bit based on a real example I encountered. Um, nurse number two has a preference of uh, only going to homes with no cats due to an allergy. So you can see that there's a conflict with service ID 1, um, where that wouldn't be a good match. So that's not a hard constraint, that's just um, a preference that, you're, that the solution may want to take into account. So this has been, obviously this problem is a real problem that all community nurse teams face. Um, so how do they deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis? So let's have a look. So here we've got three timelines. The top timeline is a um, just just the time is represented here by the clock, um, and then the second two timelines are actually the the two nurses, um, and we're going to place jobs into their schedule. And then you can see we've got three jobs that need to take place with three services. These are three treatments of patients. Um, so job number one has a time window, so it has to take place. Uh, between two times. Job number two is a double service, so we need both nurse one and nurse two um, to complete this job. And, the, uh, and job three um, has both a time window, so it needs to take place at a certain time, um, but also it has a dependency on job one. So job one needs to be completed and then there may be a time delay before job two can take place. So let's have a look. So. Job one and job two have got time windows, um, which I've added to the chart there. So ideally, they will take place between um, those shaded regions. But for example, job one has been allocated to nurse one, and they've only managed to um, allocate that to start at um, half past 12. Okay, so what we have here is what's called tardiness. So the job has started after the time window for job one has closed. So this isn't a hard constraint, it's a soft constraint. Um, so we've set the problem up in a way to make it slightly simpler to solve. Um, uh, and, but we measure this thing called tardiness, which is the lateness of a job that is started. So that's an extra thing we're going to measure in this problem. So job number two. OK, so remember, this is a double service um, and nurse two has arrived, is available and has been allocated at 10 a.m. However, nurse one can't get there until 11 a.m. So the job won't actually start until 11 a.m. So there's been some idle time here. So the nurse um, was actually available to start that um, before 11 a.m. so there's a waiting time there's there's something else we need to measure when we're when we're evaluating the quality of the solution so we kind of got this geographic problem where we want nurses to get around these patients in the most efficient time possible but in order to produce solutions we have to measure some other aspects of the problem and here we're measuring the tardiness so how late is a job starting outside of a time window and ideally we're minimizing that um, and the waiting time of a, of a nurse um, in order for a job to start. And ideally, we want to minimise that as well. So the third complication in this contrived example is um, a dependency on job one for job three. So we can see that um, ideally job three would be placed within the time window um, of about half 12 to two o'clock. However, um, we've got a dependency here on job one, which means that it cannot start before half past two. So in fact, nurse two will start this job around that time. So again, we've got more tardiness. But this time that wasn't due to any routing problem um, in terms of 
not being able to get there because of traffic or because of jobs. It was because of this dependency on job one. And job one was already late. So if job one had been able to be achieved within, realised within time window one, job three may have been able to run on time. But because it wasn't, um, this dependency meant that job three was late. So this is, a, this is, you can see just from this simple example that this is a complex problem that nurses need to deal with on a daily basis. How do they produce schedules for a team to serve patients in the most efficient way and meet their preferences, meet their treatment time windows um, and make sure they're not wasting time by sitting about? So um, when this, so this was based on a real project. Um, when I started this project, I went and um, observed how um, uh, there was four nurse teams in this area I was working in. And I went and observed how were those nurses planning um, a day or two days ahead. Uh, and the way they were doing this was with pencil and paper. So they print off a list of patients that needed to be seen the next day, about seven. So if they're working out Tuesday schedule, um, at 7 a.m. on a Monday, they would print out um, the, uh, the requirements for the next day. Uh, they would print out the um, availability of nurses for the next day. And then they would manually go through by hand trying to allocate nurses to patients. Um, order was not considered. Um, it was more about the smatching the skills of the nurse to the patient and trying not to overload the nurse at the same time. Um, so I don't want to play down the skills of these nurses because actually it was quite impressive to see them do this in practice. Um, but it was it was a very difficult job. There was there was more efficiency you could squeeze out of the system. Um, and also it was very time consuming. So this would take hours and hours and hours to to generate these schedules. Um, if that nurse then left the organisation, the knowledge that that nurse had um, would go with them. Um, and whoever came in to replace them in terms of scheduling would have to start learning the ropes again from the start. So what we did was we designed um, an algorithm to help them produce schedules um, that were both efficient, but also um, we could produce them fairly quickly for them. So how did we do this? Um, so the data science perspective on problems like this is to treat them as something called a vehicle routing problem. Uh, or the VRP. Um, so the VRP um, is one of the most famous combinatorial optimization problems you can find. Um, so in, in that problem, uh, it's, it's a routing and scheduling problem. So you're trying to determine the optimal set of routes to be formed by a fleet of vehicles um, to serve a set of customers. Um, so in this problem, uh, the vehicles or assets are, are the nurses, um, and those nurses are uh, may differ quite um, a lot in the skills they have um, and the customers uh, are the patients and the, the patients of course are quite different. But you can imagine that this sort of problem has been studied extensively in the literature um, if you get uh, for example any packages delivered by a company by Amazon this is actually a very similar type of problem. Um, however in healthcare there's often a, a large number of constraints that these problems have to take into account. So what did we produce for them? Well, we produced a decision support tool. So here's an example of it working. Um, so this is a team based in Southampton. So we can see the map of Southampton here. And the dots in this map represents patients who need to be um, visited and have care delivered by a community nurse. Um, so here, for example, is a, is a couple of routes that have been added on. Um, and those represent two nurses that would travel around the patients in a day. Um, and the, the algorithm gradually built up those routes. So we can see here a number of routes have been built up and those routes vary in their size. Um, and that's to do with the complication of the mix of skills of the nurses and requirements of the patients. So it might be that a nurse is very near to a patient um, who's, who's due for treatment next, but they really need to travel all the way across Southampton to another patient because they're the only nurse with that type of skill at that time of day who's available. So we provided a, a visual interface to the solutions that were being produced. Um, and for example, they could, they could click on um, the map and have a look at the service ID 
um, and the, the time windows that are involved there and the type of skills that are required. So now let's take a look about how we solve these problems. It's important to say that this is an extremely complicated area of optimization. Um, however, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some simpler problems and how we would go about using general methods to solve them. So in terms of routing problems, the, the absolute most famous problem is the traveling salesman problem. So in our context, you can think of this of a single nurse who has to travel out into the community and visit a group of patients. Or that could be an ambulance that has to travel out and pick up a group of patients and bring them back to the hospital. So patients only need to be visited once. And ideally, um, there's no backtracking. So you don't go back to a patient in terms of in, to visit another patient. So this is a combinatorial optimization problem. And as this problem gets larger, it becomes more intractable for mathematical methods to solve it. So we bring in algorithms to solve this, to give us good solutions to the problem. So here, for example, is a solution to this contrived example um, where we've got a good route that takes us around those patients. Now, there's no guarantee that this is an optimal route because it's been reproduced by what's called a heuristic algorithm. And we're going to learn how we apply those algorithms to this type of problem. Now, a step up from the traveling salesman problem is the, is the basic vehicle routing problem. So here we would have a team of salesmen or a team of nurses that need to go out and visit those patients. Um, so if you imagine this is a, a set of ambulances, they have, they have a very hard constraint, which is their physical capacity. So let's say they can only pick up four patients um, and we've got five ambulances or, or six ambulances. What is the best route to get around those patients and pick them up? So here we've got a, pl a 2D plane where we've got patients plotted um, and then we've got a red triangle and the red triangle represents the depot for the vehicles um, or, or that might be the hospital or the outpatient clinic that these vehicles are starting from. And they need to travel out to those patients and back again in the shortest, with the shortest with the, or the smallest cost, if you like. So here's an example solution to that. Um, of, so the vehicles have got a capacity of four. If we take this route here, we can see a vehicle's gone to one, two, three, four. Then they've travelled back. Now, vehicles don't necessarily need to, to pick up um, four patients. There may be a better solution where they only pick up three or two. Um, but in general, we'll be trying to fill those vehicles to capacity. So in healthcare, it gets even more complicated still, because actually what we're dealing with is what's called a rich vehicle routing problem. Uh, and that's for all the reasons that we've discussed so far. Um, so there's basically many facets to this problem. There's many complexities to it that need to be taken into account. So, for example, there are time windows to do with patient appointment times or medical treatment times. Um, there's issues with synchronising the assets that are travelling. Um, so, for example, patients may need two or more nurses to visit them at a single time. There's different availability of the different types of assets. So some nurses might be working a morning shift, others may be working an evening or late shift. So that needs to be taken into account in some way. Um, and the assets will vary in their configuration. So for example, an ambulance may be a four-seater ambulance or may, it may be an ambulance with a stretcher in the back that picks up a certain type of patient. So of course you will need more of those um, or it might be more difficult to pick patients up for certain times. And then a big one I always think are patient preferences. So one of the key things around patient preferences is continuity of care. Um, so in the nursing example that would mean that a patient routinely sees the same nurse um, and that's for a variety of reasons so um, one of those might be patient experience so it's a much better experience to not have to retell your story to a to a nurse each time but but it's most definitely also about the quality of care that a patient would receive so if the same nurse can see that patient they will understand that patient's issues and anxieties and can provide a much higher quality service to that patient. So it's really key to try and um, try and get that sort of continuity. And that's very difficult to achieve in practice. 
Okay, so let's take a look at some actual algorithms to solve this. So we're going to look at a family of algorithms called local search methods, which are um, a neat way to solve vehicle routing problems. So the first thing we need to do is think about how do we represent uh, such a problem in a manner that we can solve it with a computer algorithm. Well, let's take a simple example from the traveling salesman problem here. Um, so we've got um, 10 cities here. Uh, or 10 locations um, that we need to visit. We tend to refer to these as cities within the traveling salesman problem. And we've labeled those zero to nine. So a way to represent this um, within a computer is to have an array. Um, and that, that array or vector um, it has uh, integer values in it that, and the integers represent the index of the cities. Um, and the order of those um, cities within uh, the vector is essentially the order which you are going around those patients. So, for example, here we're starting at city zero, going to two, going to six, going to seven, and so on. So an important question when you're modelling this is, is this a symmetric problem or is it a non-symmetric problem? So, uh, for example, if you're modelling travel time, um, then it may be that the problem is not symmetric. So that means that it takes slightly longer to get... Um, to a location from so from location A to location B and it takes slightly it's a slightly shorter to get back from B to A and that's because there may be a slightly different route that is taken um, that you, you are forced to take on that way so a neat simplification is to obviously turn that into a symmetric problem where um, for example if we totally reverse this route and went the other way around it it's and you evaluated the cost of that it would be it would be identical um, so of course we may we may also start from a different point within this tour. So this this uh, third vector here is starting at point eight um, and travelling to uh, point seven, then point six, then point two. Um, so it's it is the same route as this one above, um, but it's starting from a different location. Um, so it's important to think about when you evaluate that, does it have the same value as the previous vector? So in, in many cases you'll be dealing with the symmetric. Um, TSP, many simple cases. And then here's an example that's com obviously completely different, um, this vector in red. Um, so we're starting from city six here, then we're going to city, uh, we're going to go to city three, then city four, then city nine. So we can see straight away that this is probably not a very sensible route, um, but it will have a different evaluation from our original route even though it just contains the same city. So the order within our representation is absolutely key for routing problems. So within local search, a really useful branch of algorithms are called hill climbing algorithms. So here we've got a, um, a contrived objective function. So our y-axis is our objective function, which we're evaluating, and then our x-axis is a series of states that we, are, that, that we may configure our representation into. So we can see here, the higher the objective, the, um, the, the better the solution. So the, our highest peak here is our global optimum. It's the thing we really want to find. We want to find the best route around those cities. And our, and our lowest here is our, is our worst. It's our worst value. But we've also got these other peaks, and they're called local optimums. So it's quite um, common for heuristic methods to get stuck in a local optimum. So it can't find that global best solution or set of best solutions. It instead finds a good solution, which isn't necessarily the best. So hill climbing algorithms um, don't guarantee finding that global optimum. They're not a global optimization algorithm. Um, because they work very simply. So essentially, you find uh, you include a random starting point, a random state, a random ordering of your TSP, and then it climbs the hill. So it will find that local optimum from that point. It will always find that local optimum. It will climb its way up. But it won't go any further than that. The algorithm will terminate at that point. So of course, we could have done a, a different random initialization of our algorithm. Um, so if we started over here, for example, it would climb up to this sort of plateau we've got over here, but it still wouldn't be able to find our global optimum. However, if we started over here, we would have found our global optimum. So they're useful, but 
as you can see, they have big limitations. So they're, sim they're very simple, they're very fast algorithms, um, but they don't guarantee on finding that global optimum. Uh, and in fact, they often don't. They will just find a, a local optimum. Um, but it turns out they are very useful and we can use them within um, more complex frameworks um, to help us get a better solution. So how do they work? So as I said, the first thing we need to do is generate an initial random solution. And so we're going to call that S. Then what we do is we, we tweak that initial solution to generate um, a new solution called R. And we would do that in some systematic way. And we'll, we'll talk about how tweak works in a second. But basically, it's a, it's a procedure that we apply to our representation of the problem. And it will change that representation of the problem to something nearby. We call that a neighbour. And then we evaluate the quality of R and S. And really all we're asking here is R a better quality solution than S? Does it provide us a better route around that TSP or vehicle routing problem than our previous solution? So if it does, then we simply move, we climb the hill, we move to we move R to S. If it doesn't, then we stick with our current solution. Um, now, after both of these steps, we ask ourselves, have we run out of time? So have we run out of budget? Uh, will we stop our algorithm at this point? Or have we got to the top of a hill? Are we no longer gonna, are we no longer gonna find any further improvement? If both of those are false, if we've, if we've still got budget left and we've not hit, the top, if not hit a local optimum, um, then we go back around that loop again. We'll, we'll apply the tweak to our modified S We'll check the quality of R and S again, and then we'll go around that loop again, again, and again, how many, as many times as we need to. However, we may have found that we've hit our peak or we've used up all our budget, in which case we terminate our hill climbing algorithm and we return S. So the mysterious tweak operator turns out to be very simple in, in things like the TSP or the basic vehicle routing problem. So here in a TSP representation of the problem, uh, we've got a uh, we've got uh, ten cities with indexes zero to nine, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to choose two of those um, cities and we're going to swap them. So you can see here we've chosen um, six and nine, and we've swapped those around. They're highlighted here, uh, and that's just called a simple tweak. Um, now the way we've chosen those may be systematic, um, or it may be random. So we may have some sort of stochastic operator. But that's the tweak. And then we would compare that, uh, the value of this solution, which is called a neighbour, to our, to our current best solution. And if it's better, we would climb the hill. Now, it turns out in practice that simple tweak is not always very good. Um, and in general, a better operator is called a two-op swap or a two-op tweak. And instead, <coughs> excuse me, what we do there is we reverse the route um, of that subsection. So we've selected um, city six and nine, and then what we do is we reverse all of that section of the route between those two points. And it turns out in practice that two opt is a very good way to improve using hill climbing. You're much more likely to find a better solution that way. Another neat thing about hill climbing is it's fast. Um, these are simple. As you can see, this is a really simple approach. Um, so we can combine it with other approaches to add just that extra bit of quality to the solution. Um, so, for example, here we've got uh, uh, an evolutionary algorithm. So it could be a genetic algorithm, for example, that we, we run maybe for 10 minutes. We've got some sort of budget. Um, and then at the end of that, we've got its best solution or, or set of best solutions that it's found. Now, there may be a few things we can do to those solutions to, to improve them. Um, so what we could do is clean up those solutions using a hill climbing mechanism. So we may include an element of um, hill climbing within our genetic algorithm. Um, and that might just, you, um, you may see, if you plotted that out, you, you, you might see that there's a few odd things that the genetic algorithm has done. And the cleanup procedure with your hill climbing would just sort those out and you would get it wouldn't have much of an improvement, but it would just give you that extra bit of quality in your solution. A second approach um, is to just run that hill climbing algorithm 
many, many times because it's so fast. So we essentially call that hill climbing with random restarts. So what we would do is we would generate, say, 10,000 initial solutions and we would hill climb all of them. Um, and if you wanted to, you could implement that in a sort of parallel algorithm. Um, so it would exploit either a large number of um, CPUs or virtual cores within your computer. And you would take the best or set of best solutions from that as your answer. So it turns out that the idea of hill climbing with random restarts is good in principle, but in practice, it doesn't always work that well. So there's a set of algorithms that try and build on that idea. Uh, and one of the most fun and most powerful of those is iterated local search. So we can, we can think of iterated local search as hill climbing with random restarts plus some intelligence about where you start from. So it's not quite random. Um, so the reason for this is we iterated local search has this concept of a home base, a place where um, in each iteration of the algorithm, we're going to start our search from nearby. So um, just to illustrate this, um, this is a fun example of um, a satellite photo of uh, the Kalahari Desert, um, and we're going to be treasure hunters. We're going to try and find a big payoff. We're going to find um, a big treasure trove within the Kalahari Desert. Um, and each night we're going we're gonna to camp in a base camp, and that's going to be marked with an X. Um, and we're going to move that base camp around depending on what we find and how we feel that day. So on our first day, starting from base camp, we know that there's no. We know that what the the treasure trove is at that base camp. We know there's not much there. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to have a bit of a random walk um, to find a starting point. Um, so we're going to, for example, here we're going to follow that purple line and we're going to start from uh, that uh, purple dot. That's going to be our initial solution for that day, um, and we're going to climb a hill. We're going to apply a hill climbing algorithm, um, and it turns out that day that we we don't find any treasure. We don't find anything better than we already had. Um, so we go back to base camp and sleep overnight. The next day we wake up and we follow the green line. So another random walk to that, that green dot and then we hill climb from that point. And hey, it turns out that day that we've um, we found a good solution to our problem. We found some treasure. Um, but maybe there's more. So what we'll do is we'll move our base camp to that location. And the next day we wake up and we do the same, but from a new location. So we now walk from our current home base to the, to the pink dot and hill climb from there. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't find any treasure that day. So the day after, we wake up and we follow the blue line. Um, and again, we hill climb from that first blue dot, our initial solution, but hey, we don't find any treasure again that day. But on this day, randomly, we decide we're gonna move our home base to that location. So we've not, we've not been finding much from our current location, so we're quite happy to move our exploration to a slightly different part of the landscape. So we sleep overnight and then we, we take a big leap the next day. We follow that yellow line to our, to our starting point, which is the um, yellow dot, and we hill climb there. And hey, we get a big payoff that day. We found by exploring a new region, we found a new solution that turns out to be really good. So this, in principle, is what iterated local search is doing. So here's some pseudocode that represents the algorithm. So you can see there isn't a lot to the algorithm. So the first thing to say is we've got our best. We've got a, we've got a record of our best solution. Um, we've got our, we've got a home where where we're starting from. Um, but we've also got this. We've got a memory of where we're starting from, and that that can be very important to solving this problem. So we've, we've not, we're not randomly moving about the landscape, we're remembering where we're starting from. Uh, and then iterated local search works unsurprisingly by iteration. So we're gonna loop while time remains um, and, that, and, and do some searching intelligently of the landscape. So our candidate is, our, is basically our starting point for that, for that day, that iteration. Um, and we're going to do some local search from that point, which is basically a hill climbing algorithm. And now you can implement any form of algorithm, hill climbing algorithm you would like um, there, or it doesn't even need to be local search. It could be something else. It could be an evolutionary algorithm. 
But here we're going to do hill climbing. So we're going to we're going to from that candidate solution, we're going to we're going to climb the hill, and then we're going to check is the quality of that new candidate better than what we've already found our best solution. If it is, we'll keep track of that location. Then we're going to make a decision about are we going to relocate our home base. Um, so we pass in our current home base and our candidate solution, and that makes a decision about uh, are we going to uh, move to that new location or are we going to stick with where we are. And then the next morning we wake up um, and we don't want to start from our home base, we want to start nearby to it, but not too nearby. So we call that a perturbation. So we're going to take some sort of random, make some sort of random tweak to our home base solution and start nearby, but not too nearby and go back round the loop and start hill climbing again. And we repeat that for as many times as uh, we've got budget for. So that budget might be um, in terms of time or it might be in just a maximum number of iterations that we're going to run. And once we've finished our budget, expended our budget, we will return the best solution that we have found. So how do you update a home base in practice? Um, so from the Kalahari Desert example, I hope you picked up that one of the important things was exploration. So it was good to have an algorithm that was interested in exploring new areas within that landscape. But at the same time, um, it can also, it's also useful to exploit good solutions that you've found. So it might be that other good solutions are clustered near to the good solutions you've already found. So the trick with updating a home base in practice is trying to balance that exploration need with the need to exploit. And often it's good to have something that explores a lot to start off with and then gradually starts to home in and exploit the best solutions it's found. So to implement this in practice, there's a, there's a couple of simple approaches and then some more complicated approaches. So you could take a random walk um, and that essentially means that for every uh, candidate solution you find, you move your home base to it. And um, so that's basically a pure exploration strategy. And um, so you gradually explore the whole of the um, home base uh, of, of the, the landscape. And it sort of um, degenerates to almost hill, start, uh, hill climbing with random restarts. Um, and then there's a greedy approach. So in the greedy approach, you only exploit. So you are only accepting a new home base if your current local optimum is better, if the, if the hill climbing finds something that's better than your home base. Uh, now that can be problematic because you're not really doing enough exploring. A third approach tries to uh, kind of go between the two of them and that's called Epsilon Greedy. Um, so in Epsilon, um, you would set a probability as Epsilon, so for example, 20%. Uh, and for 20% of the time, you would take a random walk. And then for 80% of the time, you would act in a greedy manner. And it turns out in practice that works quite well. However, one drawback of it is that really towards the end of your run of your algorithm, you really want to be focusing more on exploitation. So exploring um, to start off with and then moving into this phase of being a bit more exploitative. Um, so there's various... Um, schemes that you can use to anneal epsilon over time and that means gradually reducing epsilon from a certain value that you've set um, so you could set it for example as one so you always explore to start off with um, and it would gradually lower down to zero or some lower limit that you've specified as the execution budget of the algorithm is used up now they're just four examples in practice um, get creative uh, this is not an exact science. Um, to do this in practice, the, you know, the best algorithms are the kind of most innovative ones that, that fit the problem really well. Um, so be creative, mix and match these approaches, read the literature um, and try and see what other people have done. And maybe that will inspire you to do something similar, but slightly different. It turns out to be fantastic. So the last thing we need to think about uh, with iterated local search is how do we search nearby to a home base? Um, how do we perturb our solution? Um, so often in things like the TSP or vehicle routing, a good move is called a four opt move. Um, and you can think of that as a big tweak. Um, 
So instead of making a two op tweak, we, we essentially split the root into four parts and we swap everything over. That's illustrated by this diagram here. So uh, we split the root, uh, the root into four parts and we can see um, that, uh, for example, these two uh, cities were joined together to start off with and now they've been split apart and instead the root travels over to here instead. Um, so that's called a four opt move. Um, or sometimes called a double bridge. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite a good way to move away from your current home base, but not too far, um, because you know that good solutions tend to be clustered together. Um, when you're implementing some sort of perturbation, moving away from a home base, um, it's always important to think about memory. Um, so we saw in the general iterated local search pseudocode, history um, played a role. Now, it's totally optional to include that. Um, but one of the questions you should be asking yourself is, should I enhance my algorithm by including that memory? So we, we tend to call that a taboo list. So as your algorithm iterates, you will keep a record of starting points. So places you've already started your hill climbing from. And really, you don't want to be going back to there because you know you know what sort of solutions you're getting from starting from that point. So you can keep a list of taboo, a taboo list. These are areas that are taboo that you don't want to go back to and search again. Um, and if you find that your perturbation produces one of those, um, you would just perturb your home base again until you get a move that provides you with a new starting location. So uh, in summary, what we've looked at is uh, routine decision-making within complex geospatial health delivery problems. So a data science perspective on these problems is to frame them as a some form of vehicle routing problem, typically a rich vehicle routing problem. Um, now it turns out that's a good thing to do because there's a vast literature on combinatorial optimization and the vehicle routing problem is one of the most studied problems within, within that arena. Um, it's a, it is very complicated in healthcare because of the number of constraints that you need to include. Um, so what we've done today is we've looked at solution methods um, that are good in general um, and in particular how you would apply those to something like the travelling salesman problem or the capacitated vehicle routing problem. Um, so within that, one really important method is hill climbing. It has major limitations in terms of getting stuck in local optima, but a good way to get over that is to implement it within an iterated local search framework. Um, and that introduces this concept of a home base where you're, you know, you're helping you explore that landscape in a more sophisticated manner than hill climbing. And that's a general approach that you can apply to all combinatorial optimization problems, but in particular works very nice with vehicle routing problems. <laughs>